Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents. I'm Reggie Wade. Here with me today is a man who is a rapper, hip hop mogul, and entrepreneur. He's known the world over as Ricky Rose, or simply the boss. I'd like to welcome Rick Ross to Yahoo Finance. Rick, thank you so much for being with us. Man, thank you for having me, big homie. Thank you for having me. You have many titles, but the one I want to start talking about is author. You're coming out with a new book that is entitled The Perfect Day to Boss Up, A Hustler's Guide to Building Your Empire. So, Rick, right. why is today the perfect day to be a boss? Because personally, to me, every day is the perfect day to boss up. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I say is morning glory because me waking up, I've already won. I've won the battle of waking up, being able to be in position to make a difference. And that's what it's about. Every day we have to make some form of progress, regardless of how small the steps are. We have to make some form of progress. And just for everybody, you know, that that come to my social media platform and, you know, the first thing they want to know is, Rose, what did you do to put yourself in this position? And I tell them, you know, when you look at certain things, it's, it feel and look like it came in abundance when really we just took small steps at a time. And so that's what I'm trying to encourage. I hear that. Now, this is definitely a business book, but do you also consider this a self-help book? Um, really, it could be depending on the reader, because for me, it was something that I actually wrote over a 90 day period when the pandemic first came down. And it was just me realizing, yo, I'm waking up every day on social media more than I've ever been. Why am I doing this? It's because for the first time in 15 years, I, I haven't been able to perform. We, we canceled tours, postponed tours, rescheduled everything we had going for close to a year. So instead of me waiting a year, I just began, you know, answering some of the questions on social media that everybody wanted to hear. That's from how did you, you know, lose your weight? Did you do it naturally? You did it naturally. How did you keep it off for so long? And, you know, so I began showing them what I ate in the morning. And right now I'm showing them what I'm treating myself to, this and that. And so it's just a lot of different things. Now, in the beginning of the book, you talk about battling COVID. You said you didn't even know you had COVID until you started right. reading the symptoms. What was that like? Oh, man, it was the fungus. The fungus was among us. You know, I had the fungus before anybody knew what it was. I was actually from the go overseas and get my teeth done. And the lady that was you know, right about to take my ticket said, hold on, unless you plan on staying, you know, is it 60 or 90 days? She said, don't go. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? Calm down, baby. You, you just panicking. You see Rosé. You panicking. What the hell are you talking about? I looked up at the TV screen and it was official. So I told everybody that was with me, let's reschedule this. And, um, you know, um, once I got back home, you know, I sat down and started seeing what they was discussing, COVID-19. Me and my homie started calling it the 19. And it was, it was in January. I said, that's what I had. I had the fungus. That's the fungus. I had that in January. And I remember, you know, I sat there for two weeks. That shit was, it was painful. Rick, in your book, something that really jumped out at me is you said that you plan to stay rich forever. How big of a role does diversification play in that? Oh, man, it plays a huge it's, it plays a huge role because you never know. Um, you know, when I watch old documentaries, I was watching the documentary last night on on Detroit and General Motors. I watched documentaries on Pan Am. I watched documentaries on some of the biggest companies that's ever, um, you know, took off in this country and what was their demise? What was their demise? You know what I mean? And it make you think, damn, if Pan Am went out of business, shit, they could have been, they could have been Delta and FedEx at the same time. So you just got to find different ways to, to remain lucrative, man, and, and try to take advantage of your most valuable asset, which is time. You mentioned fellow rapper Master P, who has tremendous business acumen. He's been on Yahoo Finance several times. And why was he such a great mentor for you and what you wanted to do in the rap game, but also outside the rap game? I think one of the things that separated P to me was, you know, I love the rap a lot records, but rap a lot just sold records. Master P, I watched sell records, tour, sign the producers sign all the artists, then goddamn started with, I got the hookup. I love that. 
I love movies. I love music. And then when I saw an artist, a, mu a musician making film, doing it independent, because, you know, the way I think, I'm sure nobody just, you know, especially when I was younger, nobody not just going to see my vision. They never have because it was so big at all times. So my first film, I always told myself, I'm going to have to do myself how Master P did. So I most definitely wanted to get a brother's flowers. And just like Master P has branched out to different things besides music, so have you. You're recently in the cannabis business. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Most definitely. The cannabis is a multi-billion dollar industry. And, you know, I feel always, I feel like it's not enough black and brown brothers in it. So I partnered up with uh, Burner, the CEO of Cookies, which to me is the number one strand, the number one uh, smoke you could get anywhere. And I done been around the world at least eight times. And you know what I'm saying? Cookies always been the bomb. I met Burner um, maybe when I was on tour for my second album. I went to the Bay Area. He came through, laced me with something good. So our relationship always been genuine. And now he the biggest, he the biggest figure in the cannabis industry. And I don't think nobody would dispute that. One thing that I I I really looked at is references to crypto because everyone always talking about crypto, but I read that you're not a big fan of crypto. Why is that? Because I've never been a big fan of things I never understood. You know, that was some, uh, you know, my mom has always been, she's always been my wisdom in the back of my mind. And, you know, raising me, she always told me, Will, you know, that's what she called me, Will, try your best to always buy something you could touch. Mm, and I said, hmm. Oh, you could touch a building. You could touch. You could go and okay, I get it, I get it. I'm with that. And that's what I stuck with. You know, so um I got close people around me. I don't watch them win, take losses. They say dodge winning. Now they saying Bitcoin trying to come back. So I listen to the the hoopla, but shit, Rose solid, you know, you're around, man. I hear that. And you know, despite being the boss and having all the trappings of a luxurious life. Reading your book, I see there's a certain humbleness to your business strategy. You talk about bosses always staying students. Do you think that mindset is missing from a lot of folks once they become successful? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, it's easy to become successful. It's easy to become wealthy. It's easy to see yourself going from a one bedroom and now you look up, you on a three level apartment, you know, across from Central Park or whatever it is. And you can get comfortable. And it's a lot of people that could feel they know it all. But to me, I, I want to remain a student on all levels. I can learn something. It don't matter if I walk into one of my franchises, I pick up the broom, I start sweeping. You know, I see somebody, you know, frying some chicken and damn, that thing looking crispy. How long you had that in there? How long, how did you drop it? Did you season it before? You know, I'm just one of them dudes. Speaking, you have 25 Wingstop franchises and you recently opened one in your hometown of Clarksdale, Mississippi. What right. is that like being in the food business and especially opening it up a spot where you were born and raised? To me, it's, it's you know, I'm to a point where it's just not about um, the profits. Of course, you got to win. That's the only way you you remain and sustain what you got going on. But now it's also about, you know, helping helping others, you know, and making those statements and making sure the youngsters that's from where you're from know that they can accomplish this too. Because to me, that's what's important. You know, it was different things that inspired me. It wasn't always what somebody would assume. I remember what made me want to play football was when, I used to watch Richmond Webb, who was an offensive lineman. He had an S600 white with the white rims, the same the same type of car I had, which was a BMW in my very first video, Hustling. That was something that blew my mind. I used to, you know, make sure every day I would walk to 183rd because he lived in Miami Lakes. I knew where he lived just watching the car so, so damn much. Where they practiced that off 37, they practiced behind a local college. They come up 183rd and I would go stand out there just to watch the car. And when I missed it, I'd be disappointed. But that's what made me want to play football. Just seeing the homie ride down the street, just looking like he was just so comfortable. I say, damn, he finna go pick his girl up. They probably finna go to Houston's and get that salmon. You know what I'm saying? I hear that. Now, I want to touch back 
because you said that there's not a lot of black and brown folks in the cannabis space. And we see a lot, a lot of black business owners struggle to get started. What problems do you think are the biggest obstacles when it comes to black business ownership? Well, you know, we got to look at, you know, the reality first and foremost is the fact that we we've always been, you know, steps behind in the knowledge and the financing. And I could just go on and on. And uh, I think the first thing we need to change is how we deal with each other. And I think that's what this book represents. That's what me being on social media represent. Um, um, us communicate because a lot of times you 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 could be in a room with widely successful people and um, they're not really sharing their knowledge. They're not really sharing their game. And why is that? Do they feel you're not qualified? Do they feel you you won't do anything with it? And I knew at one point I may have fit that description. Somebody that somebody may have not felt would do something with the knowledge and I would. So, you know, I'm not in position to judge nobody. I just want to get a game to who's seeking it. Come get it. Come get it. I was one of the dudes in the back of the classroom. I never learned the the, the, the pre-algebra A equals X and all that shit. That shit was a different. I just didn't get that. You know what I'm saying? I never got that. And, you know, so don't count Rose out. Don't count Rose out because we're in a totally different position now. Focus is a big part of what you've done in the business world. And you write that empires are built brick by brick. Why right. is it so important to master one thing before you branch off to the next? Because to me, you have to uh, establish and feel greatness in some form or fashion to really take you to that next level. That's just like being an artist. Um, as an artist, I sat in the basement for 10, 15 years writing records for others writing records for myself, writing records. And as an artist, you're looking for recognition. And that's not what determines you're a great artist. You was a great artist sitting in the basement. But until you gain that recognition as an artist, after you've been Grammy nominated certain times, wow, okay, now we can approach this with, with, with you know, just on a certain frequency, a certain frequency. And I think that's what, um, that's what it really make you great. When you were a young man, you worked at a car wash and I heard that you would go above and beyond your duties. What would you do and how do you think that set a foundation to the things that you're doing now? Um, you know, first, I did work at a car wash and I want to say I may be maybe 13 years old when, when, go ahead, um, 13 years old when, uh, I began working at my first car wash. And for one, I loved cars. I loved cars. That was huge to me. At one point when I first was working, I may have did it for free just to, you know, just to, you know, look at the cars, deal with the cars. But, you know, after being there a little while, I understood my love for cars. I understood. And I began having a relationship with the, the hustlers that brought the cars. And not that I'm getting off topic. What was the question again? No, I said, how did that set a foundation to the things you're oh. doing now? Oh, it let me know that I would do the best when I was doing things that I loved. If I was taking the trash out with someone else, and I may not have been the best at that. But when it came to cars, I would clean the cars, wash the cars. Hey, Amen. Um, I wouldn't even set a set price. But, you know, if you show me some love, I'll fill the car. Leave me the money. i fill the gas up. i got them. Put your CD case um in alphabetical order you know it depends but i knew that's what i love to do i love to be around hustlers i love sitting in cars if i was messing with your cd or cassette um case listening to your music i was like damn i want to get my music system like this what size speakers those is two tens four tens those alpines oh um, i get it i get it you know, I'm a huge boxing fan. So when I read that you bought a Vander the Real Deal Holyfield's house, that was unbelievable. What did you learn about the former champ situation? Because I know you didn't buy that house directly from him. No, no, I didn't. You know, I just understood that um, every time I go through those double gates, I realize and I tell myself, um, you have to take 
you have to take every day seriously. You know, this is a piece of property that a brother spent 25 million putting together his dream and it collapsed. I came behind him, bought it for 5.9, invested back into it. Now, how do I keep myself out of the same position of a brother that was making $35 million a night? A fight. Okay, I see what I got to do. I'm going to take this shit serious as hell. I'm going to grind. I cut my own grass. From my understanding, he had 17 people that was, you know, maintaining the close to 300 acres at that time. And now I have close to 400. And, you know, I bought my own tractor. My partners, my homies get out there with me. I'm cutting the bulk of the grass. They edging. They, you know, fucking with the mulch. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> teamwork make the dream work. So that's our, that's our different approach. Rick, I know you must get stopped by the young kids who always look into you for advice. What's the biggest piece of advice you would give a young man? Let's say a 13 year old who's working at a car wash like you did. What would you tell them? I think the most valuable thing I could tell them is put God first. And I think you got to believe that meaning you got to believe in something. You know what I'm saying? You got to believe in yourself after that. Because if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to make it regardless of what you do. You could be great. You could run a goddamn three, nine and a 40. But if you don't believe in yourself, you're going to drop the ball every time they throw it to you. So you got to believe in yourself. And I tell them that. And f it. Run fast as you can to the end zone. And when they throw it to you, just stay focused and tell yourself you're going to catch it. Because after you catch that damn ball a couple of times, it's going to come a point where your confidence is so high, you're going to feel you won't never drop it. And that's where you want to get. And once you get there, it's on and pop. <laughs> Rick, you write about systemic racism and how you felt that the conversation needed to be more about more than venting frustrations. How have you used your platform to help fight these injustices? Well, first and foremost, you know, I got a mother that's from Clarksdale, Mississippi, which can easily be disputed as one of the most racist states, if not in the world. And I wasn't taught to be racist by my mother. She worked all the way up to become a registered nurse and she worked amongst all races. And she just always told me, if a person do right by you, you do right by them, regardless of the race. And so that's what I apply. You understand? And, 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 and I'm so glad and thankful that that's how she raised me because me doing business, me having fans, you know, a lot of my fans come from, you know, um, different countries, different backgrounds. And, and, you know, they show me a lot of love, you know, sometimes the most. And it's just all about being genuine. So as long as you remain genuine, you got an opportunity at winning. Anything other than that going to f*** you <coughs> Rick, one of my favorite chapters in the book was Mastering the Art of the L. You always hear people say, just take the L. And you've done a lot of winning in your life. But how has learning to lose made you a better business person? Um, learning to lose, I believe, helped me conquer fear. Learning to lose helped me conquer fear because once you master the L, once you learn to lose, you understand, damn, I could go out on the football field, lose the day, and still hold my head up as a champion. The team that I lost to respect me as a champion. And, you know, they know when we run it again, they going to take that L. They know what it is. And, and, and so that was just my mind frame. And once I overcame fear, I applied that to everything I done being an artist, me coming in the industry as an artist. I said, OK, this hip hop, this shit supposed to be about, you know, who the biggest, who the baddest. I'm going to step up and, you know, I'm going to challenge whoever supposed to be the biggest and the baddest. I'm going to step, you know, I'm approaching with the music, with the wordplay and how else they want to take it. And they're going to feel me. And that's what I did when I got in the rap game. I stepped on a lot of feet, stepped on a lot of toes. And me going on my 11th or 12th album, ain't nobody stepped on Rose toes yet. Ain't nobody wrinkle up these joints. Rick Ross, thank you so much for joining us. The one and only Ricky Rose, music mogul, now author. The perfect day to be a boss, a hustler's guide to building your empire. Yeah, right, thank right, you so right. much for speaking with Yahoo Finance. Man, thank you for having me, man. You're doing a great job. You're a genius, brother. And anytime you need Rose, just holler at me. I'm here. Thank you so much, my brother. I appreciate it. Stay Thanks safe. You.